Right, I am going to talk about evolutionary programming today, which is something I came across about a decade or so ago, uh, when I first started with APL. And I thought it was very interesting, or it sounded very interesting, but my skills in APL weren't quite up for implementing it. And since then, I've been busy working on pension programs and other exciting projects. And it only occurred to me this summer that I, I need to get back to a hobby project. So I spent uh, a couple of weeks in Italy trying to implement a couple of variations of genetic or e evolutionary algorithms. So what are these evolutionary algorithms? Uh, well, they're inspired by biological evolution. So uh, they're trying to solve problems by creating a population of individuals and then applying genetic operators to uh, create a new, a new generation from the fittest individuals in your pop initial population. Um, they're, they're often used to solve optimization problems, typically NP-hard problems where uh, you at best get an approximation of the best solution if, uh, if you want to get an answer today, as it were. So uh, they're, qu they're quite successful in that area. And they can also be used to generate artificial intelligence in games or robots. We've seen examples of uh, crab-like robots that are starting off standing still or sitting down, as they were, and learn how to use their motors and uh, sensors to get up and move about and explore their world. So it's quite interesting how uh, uh, the technology can mimic nature and, and get something working. There's, uh, there are several subcategories to genetic um, or evolutionary algorithms. Uh, the one called genetic algorithm is trying to find a solution to a problem in the form of strings or numbers. So uh, the, the problem, in the problem you have a fixed program, you know the formula you want to apply, but there's, there are parameters coming in that vary and you want to find the best set of parameters to solve your problem. An uh, interesting and fun application of this is, of course, to use artificial neural networks that consist of arrays of numbers. So these arrays of numbers can be uh, uh, used as chromosomes in your population. And you want to find the best set of weights and biases to take your input and produce an output that makes it work. So typically what we've seen before in artificial neural network examples is that you train them. So you feed them a lot of data with an expected result, and by feeding it more and more data, you teach the neural network what it needs to know uh, about identifying uh, hand signatures or road signs. So this approach is slightly different, and well, the little image I put there is just my simple implementation of an ant exploring its world, so we'll look at that a little bit later. Genetic programming is turning that on its head, so it's got a program that is variable, and the parameters are fixed. So you know what you're feeding into this program, but you want to find a program that solves the problem, so in the textbook example, you have some input parameters, 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, a function, and you get a result. This particular problem I'm trying to solve is a quadratic equation. So it might not be obvious, but the result there is the, uh, a quadratic equation. So it's, it's trying to, to find the best solution for that, where f is variable. And I will show you a little bit more on that, but essentially what you'd need is a representation of your program that can be uh, worked on using genetic operators, and function trains lend themselves to that, so we'll take a look at that later. Right, I've men mentioned genetic operators, and as you can see, I've, I've picked, a, uh, well, the, the ba most basic ones, the selection, crossover, and mutation, uh, they sound familiar. Uh, the um, survival of the fittest, for example, in the natural world, 
the selection process is picking individuals from a population that it wants to propagate into the next generation. So um, uh, to do that, of course, we'd need to evaluate the individual. How fit is this individual? And uh, we devise something that is termed a fitness function, uh, which describes the uh, ideal solution. So given a, an individual, you compare it to your expected parameters and uh, the boundaries of the problem, and you give it a scoring. And that scoring is, is up to you. But uh, ideally, you want to make sure that the population evolves, moves towards the optimum. So you need to be careful to devise a fitness function that encourages the move in that direction. Having a binary fitness function that just says, yes, you solved the problem, or no, you didn't, doesn't help in evaluating that. So you need to be more specific about your uh, fitness function. Small encouragements like, yes, you're, you've got the right rank, but wrong numbers, or similar. So fitness proper, uh, pr proportionate selection uh, is the idea that you would pick individuals uh, from your population probabilistically. So say you have a population, you've applied the fitness function, and you've got a fitness in the range of 0 to 100, where 100 is a perfect solution. When you uh, pick the individuals to propagate to the next generation, you don't simply pick the best ones, because the, the poorer performing individuals can actually contain some genes in their chromosomes that would contribute to an optimal solution. So you don't want to discard them. But the probability that they will survive to the next generation is smaller. So you set up some sort of a, a, a function to, to derive that. And I, I, I just threw this in. It's, I think, one of my first attempts at it. And it just worked, so I haven't touched it again. So, uh, but essentially, it allows you to define how many individuals you want to pick from your population and then using the fitness of uh, the entire population, it probabilistically picks as many as you've asked for. A tournament uh, selection is uh, an alter alternative way to try to encourage a little bit more um, uh, favorism of, of poorer individuals. So rather than looking at the entire population when you pick your individuals, you set a tournament size, say a tenth of the entire population, pick random uh, individuals of that size, and then pick your indi individuals based on fitness. So the fitness doesn't come into play until you've started the tournament, selected your subset. That means that individuals with lower fitness will have a slightly higher chance of making it in, in the selection process. And yeah, that's another example of that. I won't delve into it too much. The code is available on GitHub, and I'll show you the links later. Elitist selection is the fittest survives. So not, uh, the, the fittest individuals automatically get picked. And um, it, in, in some or many scenarios, it's, it's good practice to include a few of these, even though in real life and in the biological world, it doesn't happen very frequent. Um, so you, you don't want to lose the best one because of chance. So you, you keep the best individuals in your pop, uh, population. Right. The next genetic operator is a crossover um, or recombination. This is the uh, exciting bit, right? You've got two or more parents, so two, two or more individuals from the population. You pick those and you recombine them to generate a child solution. Um, it doesn't happen that often in the natural world that you would include more than two parents. Often there's only one, but, uh, well, most frequently there's two. <laughs> uh, and uh, in, in evolutionary algorithms, uh, 
in some scenarios, it's found to be uh, more beneficial to mix more than two parents because you, you may pick more good bits of multiple parents and, and create the child, so it speeds things up a little bit. Uh, the, the approach of uh, recombination depends very much on the representation of the chromosome, so a uh, textbook example again is where you've got a simple array, so you've got a red parent and a blue parent, and that could be anything, a binary vector or, or a, a matrix or any simp simple representation like that. And you uh, identify crossover points. Um, this, this particular example is a uniform crossover, so you, you know that you want to mix them equally, 50% of each parent and you slice up the parents I in a random fashion into chunks that you then swap the uh, uh, genes of. So you would pick either one of these children or both to propagate to the next generation. In uh, the genetic programming world, it's a little bit more important how you recombine. So if you represent your algorithm as a, or your program as a function tree, we've got two trees here representing two parents. You would identify a node where you want to do the swap or recombination. So you may choose to move this node and this node and you swap the entire branches instead. And that's to uh, try to avoid creating programs that do not execute or, or um, uh, um, uh, wait, what was the term I was looking for? The, um, you don't want to change the, um, the program too much. I mean, if you just swapped nodes randomly in a, uh, in a function train, you might break, break the, uh, the intention of the branches. Didn't explain that very well, but you'll see a little bit more about that if we have the time. The last genetic operation is mutation, which of course also happens in the biological world. Uh, typically the mutation rate in nature is very, very low. In evolutionary algorithms it's higher. <laughs> Because uh, th the idea with mutation is that if you start with an initial population and just create all sorts of combinations of those, you're limited to, the, to a certain area of the solution space. Uh, so uh, mutation encourages a, a jump in the solution space to potentially more optimal solutions. Um, without it, you may find yourself finding minimum, uh, or local minimum, uh, or, or local maximum values in your optimization. So um, this is quite an important part of um, the genetic operators. Right, so how would you implement a genetic algorithm or genetic programming? The first question you need to ask yourself is can the solution to the problem be represented in a way that lends itself to these genetic operators. So, um, you, in the examples that I've shown, if you have a way of, of dealing with an array of numbers or array of text, that can be easily manipulated using these operators. And similarly, for the genetic programming, if you can describe your program in a way that makes it easy to apply these operators, so a function train again, is, is relatively easy to represent uh, as a chromosome. So um, that's the first step, of course. And then you create a random population of a size that you think is suitable. Suitable is anything from 10 to 1,000 individuals in a population. Um, you devise a fitness function and you calculate or you apply it to your individuals. Then uh, you need to think of when to terminate, when have you found a solution to your problem. And that, that's very different depending on what you're trying to solve. But uh, if, if um, uh, to give a few examples, 
you, you may want to run it for uh, an exact number of generations. So don't run this more than a thousand generations because I'm quite happy that I will have found a solution by then. You can uh, define a fitness threshold. So if your fitness is in the range of zero to 100, you may say that if I find a fitness of 95, I'm happy. I, I don't want to carry on. Or if you've got limited time, I need to solve this before the boss asks me on Friday, so I'll just run it till Thursday night. Another way of terminating the run. The um, breeding part is as I described, so you pick uh, using one of your, your select operators, you pick uh, new, the new individuals to propagate to the next generation, recombine them, ap apply the mutation factor, and there you go, you've got the next generation. And you go back to step one. Calculate fitness. Right, that's the uh, uh, Prezi slideshow. I think it's, we, we've got a few minutes for demo. So I'll go back to my APL screen here, right? This is the first time I use a demo script, so I'm very excited. I'm not sure if I got this right. If we look at uh, the um, gener uh, ge genetic algorithm example, which is this ant brain, the way uh, it works in, in this implementation is that I, I create, or I'm, I'm actually using the artificial neural network code that Callum Flirm and I worked on last year when exploring artificial neural networks. So under the hood here, it's just creating an instance of an artificial neural network. Um, and we can see that uh, it's got two weights arrays uh, or matrices. Can you read this, by the way? Yeah? So uh, in this one, we've got two matrices of size 27 by 10 and 10 by 2. And what that tells us is that there is an input layer of 27 neurons, a hidden layer of 10, and the output layer of 2. So feeding it 27 binary, or is it binary? Yes, binary um, digits we should end up with something on the other side, which is two bits only. And those two bits are to represent the action that the ant will uh, take in this world. So in my implementation, it will either turn left, right, move forward, or mark the spot that it stands on, which is all it knows, because uh, the uh, input to his brain is uh, defined by whether there's a food marker uh, uh, on the surrounding cells. If there's, um, if there's a marking that he's set, or um, the third one, oh, it escapes me now, I can't remember what the third one was. If there's a block, right, there's an obstacle as well. So uh, there could be either food, obstacle, or uh, he's set a marker. Those uh, nine cells, so the cell he's standing on, plus the surrounding ones, uh, for these three distinct um, items are fed in. So that's why we end up with 27 input uh, in the in neurons in the input layer. And same thing with the biases that are crucial in this. If we look at the um, GP chromosome, the genetic programming, it looks slightly different. And this was an unfortunate example here. So that's a single node for uh, an individual. So it's just, uh, yeah, this, well, pick scan reduction on the first axis. I don't think that will do much good, to be honest. Well, we could try. Right, and there's a, an interesting thing there as well, which in genetic programming, you may want to have terminal sets. So you might want to feed it some sort of number uh, in some of the nodes. So that's another, probably a very unfit individual. I haven't uh, been too strict about what 
the individuals may look like is very much randomized, but still allowing for scan and um, um, reduction op operators. So that's that. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick run through of how you would use this, this simulator and this implementation of the genetic, genetic algorithm. Um, so uh, if we start out with the ant world, I uh, have this function called world, which will, as a left argument, defines how many, uh, or the percentage of food and the percentage of obstacles that we want uh, to include in the world, plus the size. So this is a shorthand for a 10 by 10 world with 5% food and 20% obstacles. Looking at that, you see how I've used a three-dimensional array where the top layer is the food, uh, the second layer is the obstacles, and if we look further down, we'll see the um, markers that he's left. There's a fourth layer which is used for the framework itself to show where the ant has moved. It doesn't feed into the brain of the ant, so it's purely to evaluate its fitness. And um, if we look at the fitness function that, oh, let me just, the fitness function that uh, I've come up with is simply encouraging eating food. So he gets 20 points for each food he eats, and then I look at the layer containing the visited cells and, and give him one point for each cell that he's visited on this world. So given that we've got a few obstacles, and um, um, a few bits of food, the um, fitness can go up to about, oh, I have to do some counting now, 80, 180 maybe. Um, so that's the top score that it can potentially get. Right, I've got some settings to, did, uh, to um, um, outline the run for this evolution. And as I described, I've got a termination, um, a termination point when it reaches a thousand generations. I've set the mutation rate to 20%, a population size of 10, and the simulation steps 200 means I will run, it, run the simulation of this ant 200 steps and see how far it gets. Um, that will make sure that it gets enough moves to find the food and explore the map as much as possible. A survival rate of 0 0.01, which um, is relating to the elitism selection. So I, I will always pick one out of, uh, well, 1% of all the ants, of all the 10 ants rounded up. So one of the ants will always survive to the next generation. And then I run the evolution, passing it the world that I've created and all the settings, and it will evaluate these. And as you can see, the fitness is increasing with each generation. Well, with some of the generations, it improves. Um, what did I set it to? A thousand. I don't think I want to run it through all thousands. As we have, what is it, two minutes left? One minute? <laughs> yeah, okay, well. I think uh, I will interrupt this one. It, it was fun for a few seconds. Um, let's see if we can just do a, a quick, quick run. So we'll set the max generations to 50. And it's simply just rerunning it. Oh, it didn't get very far. Right. And um, uh, the result here contains it, it logs all the um, best or fittest individuals in each generation, so you can track it, as you were. So if we look at the Hall of Fame, you can see that not a lot changed. It went from the first generation of 22 to 46 in the second, and then this stopped. Actually, I'll run that once more just to see if it gets a little bit better. Um, and it, it's just a summary um, of, of the um, evolution run, so it makes it a little bit easier to inspect. What I'll do is I'll pick the um, uh, first um, 
ant of each fitness level, just to demonstrate this in a renderer. So here we see the first generation, and it simply turns on the spot. Not very fit. The next generation, it starts exploring a little bit, but gets stuck. And as we go through generation by generation, we see how it evolves into an artificial brain that makes slightly better moves. Um, yeah, as you can see, it's not particularly clever. Here's one I created earlier. I let this run a little bit more. And um, all right, this is the same uh, sort of approach, so not super exciting either. But if we go down a few generations, it will reach a maximum. This example is just changing the game completely, so it's got no obstacles. I found that the obstacles were helping it guide it, so I wanted to see what it would do if it didn't have anything to guide it. And um, yeah, <laughs> it knows how to move forward. It knows how to turn when it sees food, which is unfortunate because I wanted to eat the food. Slightly better, but without anything around it, it doesn't know where to turn. Uh, here it's learned to turn when it sees food, but still doesn't leave any markers to, to help him explore the entire map. And same thing there. Not much better. And here we see this, the introduction of markers, which is quite exciting to see that it learns that actually I can set markers to help me remember where I've gone and it improves that slightly. And then it gets stuck in its old patterns like we all do. <laughs> Not quite. How about now? Ah, is it in a loop now? I believe. Yeah, it still turns when it sees the food. Maybe it looks old and manky. Doesn't look too enticed. Yeah. Maybe you're also getting bored of this. And I can see a zero in front of me, so either I'm a loser or I've run out of time. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I've run out of time, but if you would like to see an example of the genetic programming, I can run through that quickly. Or you can just start clapping if you don't want to. <laughs> okay, well, let's see if we can skip this. Demo of GP. Right. Uh, this is the actual example I showed you in the slides, so I, I'm going to let it run through. And as you can see, after 13 generations, it's actually found a solution to the quadratic problem I set out, which is, I believe, simply 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x quadrupled. <coughs> So, yeah, if you don't know how to write uh, function trains, there you go, that's... <laughs> it, and it, uh, it made me curious to see how it would perform with um, regards to the, you know, the shorthand version of writing that expression in APL using the power, op power function. And uh, it turns out this outperforms it. I'm not sure why that is, but it's not something I recommend doing, if, if you know the formula. This isn't the first thing that would come to mind. <laughs> I guess I can wrap up there. <laughs>